okay, then we'll start with the lecture on um, cumulative causation <coughs> and uh, endogenous growth, which uh, these two theories are kind of of complementary to each other. Uh, I will also start with the theory of new economic geography uh, towards the end of the lecture. Uh, and uh, these, these theories are sort of uh, uh, complementary where Myrdal's theory was the first one uh, and uh, the endogenous growth theory and new economic geography has contributed to a, let's say, deeper understanding of the mechanisms that are uh, uh, inherent in, in Myrdal's uh, theory. Gunnar Myrdal was, uh, his, uh, he was a Swedish economist, Nob Nobel Prize laureate. I think he got the prize in 72 or something like that, 1972. Uh, he is perhaps mostly known for his uh, development of the so-called Scandinavian welfare model with a, with a type of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, a merge between <coughs> economic efficiency considerations and distributive policies. So his understanding of the, the need for a distribution of wealth in a society and how that distribution of wealth could actually contribute to increased efficiency was, uh, was quite uh, groundbreaking at, uh, at the time, around 1960. And uh, <coughs> if, you, if you read American newspapers like New York Times, uh, they have quite recently discussed whether the United States and the federal policy of in the United States should be more focused on a change in the direction of the Scandinavian welfare model, with more focus on public services, public health services, and, uh, and so on. But here we are going to, <coughs> to talk about uh, this, uh, this cumulative causation theory in light of economic development and economic growth. So <coughs> the, the point of departure here is that the theories of international trade, and you can translate that to, to regional trade, trade between regions in a country, or between countries within a region like, like Europe. Um, it doesn't capture the consequences of imbalance between rich and poor, let's say, trade partners, countries, or regions. So <coughs> uh, the equilibrium theory, which we have discussed briefly on a couple of occasions, where then labor and capital are moving to areas with the highest return, it doesn't fit well with reality. So <coughs> there, is a, uh, there is an observation that the differences between uh, developed and developing countries increases. And uh, that is also a uh, that was his, uh, his concern was to try to explain why such differences took place. And now we are back in the 40s and 50s, 1940s and 1950s. So to, to try to understand the mechanisms here could also uh, contribute to an understanding of economic growth mechanisms as such. But the point of departure was the gap between rich and poor countries. 
to, 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 to put it brief, brief and why that gap uh, continued to, to grow uh, in the, in the post-World post War II uh, period. <coughs> so, he, his book, which is called Economic Theory of Underdeveloped Regions, 1957. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of the main source for this, uh, for this uh, sorry about the noise, but I can't help it, so I'll try to speak up. Um, <coughs> in that book, he is verbally describing a lot of the mechanisms that is, uh, that is uh, at work here when we talk about the differences and the increasing differences between uh, trade partners, w where the kind of transactions are taking place between uh, partners that are not balanced, one rich and one poor trade partner, which was a classical situation when we consider trade between rich and poor countries. <coughs> so here he describes a cumulative causation pattern. Hunger causes bad state of uh, affairs when it comes to health, resulting in low working capacity, which will, return, uh, which will uh, in, um, result in increased poverty and increased uh, hunger problems. And there you go. So he, he was kind of starting out with this, this uh, downturn negative spiral, if you like, or the vicious circle of poverty. So <coughs> unless you reach what we can call the critical mass of wealth in the country, you end up in this kind of, of downturn, this vicious circle. Uh, so so uh, the, this seems quite trivial, but it is, it was the starting point for quite a lot of research on which mechanisms are has have this nature of being cumulative <coughs> and what mechanisms are causing increase or decrease in wealth to take place. So this was the starting point, a citation from, uh, from this book. And if you look, if you, if you, if you look around a bit and try to find some examples you can see uh, quite a lot of, uh, of cases which are uh, right in the front of uh, our eyes, so to speak. <coughs> These are two cases that I have seen the results of uh, because I, I was there uh, at the... At the <laughs> that one I cannot compete with. Okay, one chance. Um, yeah, I'll go and talk to them, I think. I cannot. They stopped. <coughs> so, um, the military defense problem in former Eastern Germany, where where uh, <coughs> the, the merge between Eastern and Western Germany resulted in a, in a, uh, a strong reduction in the, in the need for, for defense. 
So they, they downscaled the defense industry. And uh, that hit regions in the, uh, in the east of Germany towards the, the border of Poland quite, quite hard. So I was there uh, <coughs> some 15 years ago, and then the unemployment rate was around 20%. And uh, and uh, the social consequence of that was, was quite, quite evident. They were quite evident. And we can, <coughs> as you have done in a, in a group work, you can analyze such patterns or consequences of such a downscaling of a, of a cornerstone industry by means of an input-output analysis. So, <coughs> Demand for supplies, employment is reduced, local tax revenues are reduced, leading to reduction in public services, which reduces local employment even more. <coughs> the attractivity of the region may be, may, or will be, most certainly be reduced, and so on. Steel plants in South Africa, <coughs> So, those who are in favor of boycotting countries for, a, for, an extend, for a long period of time should perhaps think twice about that. It's, uh, it's, it's easy to see Ja, helt feil. Jeg får høre hva jeg selv sier en gang. I think we can continue. Um, <clears throat> because when they lifted the boycott against the apartheid regime in South Africa, uh, they exposed a rather strong domestic steel industry to competition, international competition. And the, the steel industry, the domestic steel industry in South Africa was built up because they were not allowed to trade with other countries. So they couldn't get steel from, uh, from anywhere else, so they needed to, to extract it by themselves. And uh, <coughs> when the boycott was lifted, the steel industry was wiped out more or less overnight. So uh, I think the employment rate in that area was more than 50% for, for, uh, for many years and the problems are still, still, uh, still evident from that period. So, so that is kind of an extreme case of removing barriers to trade and 
the extreme case is that the, the barrier was sort of absolute. They were not allowed to trade in the first place. And then suddenly the trade was opened up. The partners were not balanced at all. And then the weak part, South Africa in this case, had to, had to, to turn down or to shut down a very important industry leading to severe consequences. So this is, <coughs> this is a, a way of trying to, to work out um, mechanisms and to illustrate mechanisms behind cumulative growth or circular and cum cumulative mechanisms that can stimulate growth or vice versa they can cause a self-reinforcing downturn so if we start <coughs> here because we are occupied with transport infrastructure and try to improve infrastructure in an area. The reason for doing that, and you can just look at the newspapers and the plans that are put forward for big infrastructure investments, almost all of them <coughs> are talking about attracting industry, stimulate economic growth in the local area and so on. So try to achieve something like this. If you are able to reach that objective, <coughs> that you attract new firms, you can have an expansion of local employment and population connected to that new activity. You increase the local supply of skilled labor. I leave that for now, skilled labor because that is where we have a clear link to endogenous growth theory, which I will talk about a bit later on. <coughs> so this is one circle. More people, more skilled people, increasing in its own sake the attract attractivity of the region, because the size of the system increases. A second circle goes like this. You need to have a development of the supplying industry to supply this new activity. New industries and let's say also the growth in existing industries. So <coughs> we develop external economies for existing and new enterprises. And I will talk more about that later on, what external effects mean here. The shorthand version is that the existing and new enterprises get access to cheaper supplies, lower prices on their, uh, on their supplies. Uh, they get access to more knowledge and perhaps also a larger product variety in the area. A third circle is going from here when you expand local employment and population. You attract capital and companies so you add on to the uh, supplying industry. So you expand companies serving the local home market, which also contributes to the development of external economies. Again, I will come back to that. And then you have <coughs> this circle also leading to an uh, increase in tax revenues 
because you get more activity, higher tax revenues, and that may in turn result in more or higher, higher investment in improved infrastructure. And there you go with a circle. So these <coughs> one, two, three, four circles are kind of vital for, for the understanding of, uh, of the circular and cumulative logic. And below or underneath these boxes are some interesting mechanisms at work, which we will, uh, I will talk about uh, in, 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 in turn here now. When you worked with um, the calder dixon turtle model, this four-step model, you remember that? There you actually tried to calculate a kind of cumulative causation um, uh, structure. But we didn't, <coughs> you didn't calculate, let's say, all of these, uh, these four circles. Because uh, in that model, which was developed actually a bit before this, uh, this uh, cumulative causation model by Myrdal, uh, all the productivity effects of increased economic activity was captured in this Ferdorn coefficient. If you remember this lambda that, you, that was a part of, of the equation one in the four-step model, this lambda was the <coughs> Ferdorn coefficient, captured, which captured the productivity change from a change in the size of the economic system. So here we actually <coughs> try to break down this Ferdorn coefficient. We study increase in, uh, skill in the amount of skilled labor, meaning that you get a higher productivity per man hour on average, that you get uh, lower prices on, uh, on, on products that are, ne are needed for production. Um, both by means of uh, better products as a result of increased competition and also as a result of an increased size of the production, meaning that you can exploit economies of scale in production. But all of that was sort of merged into one single uh, coefficient uh, when we dealt with the four-step model. Well, this is uh, <coughs> much of the same model as on the previous panel, but it is expanded a bit by also including some of the some external factors. Like that can affect also <coughs> location behavior, like national facilities, then we can talk about uh, ports, you need, you need a, a, uh, access to a river or, a, or the sea to, to have, have, have seaports. Local industrial milieu, which is, can be a story about an existing cluster of related industries that are pre present, uh, already present in the area, and which may also attract new firms. But uh, a, 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 a local industry cluster is also a result of a process like this in the first place. And we'll, we'll also talk more about industry clusters, not next week, but the week after. We have <coughs> the national in infrastructure policy and the national financial policy that also affects in the way in which, or in the amount in which we can invest in, in infrastructure, like transport infrastructure. And here you see the link to 
this uh, this welfare model of with a with a uh, with a well functioning equity policy that you can actually have a national or regional or even re, uh, let's say multinational model for boosting let's say the amount of infrastructure provided to the public in general as a means to to boost off economic growth the 10 EU EU 10 10 stands for trans european networks and you have 10T which is uh, transport and i think there is something called 10E which are which is energy or trans or um, it's a it's a eu fund where the objective is to support infrastructure and uh, also cross border cross border infrastructure to facilitate trade flows and to reduce transport costs to attract businesses and so on so this th this thinking has been uh, quite um, uh, or in recent years, let's say uh, 30 years ago and up to now, the infrastructure as a means for, uh, for creating economic uh, growth has been quite, quite strong. Then it's easy to draw boxes and arrows like this. And it's easy to, to state these mechanisms. The hard part is to try to prove it in terms of uh, empirical research to see whether it is actually working like this. And uh, <coughs> that is something that I will uh, spend some time on next week to try to show you some recent research on, on uh, what you might call the wider economic impacts of transport infrastructure. which. Uh, which covers uh, any, uh, advances taking place during the last five to seven years. We're trying to investigate whether you really get this skilled labor external economies from increased uh, or uh, focus on transport infrastructure investments. Uh, <coughs> Myrdal, he used the terms backwash effects and spread effects. Uh, and um, this is going right into the core of a country's regional policy. Uh, for instance, in, in Norway, we have had during the last 25 years yeah 25 years programs public programs which supports urban infrastructure projects big packages of uh, road building uh, projects and uh, public transport projects, uh, there has been subway development programs in Oslo and, uh, and other types of public transit programs and also motorways, highways around the bigger cities in this country. And I guess the same situation uh, occurs in, in many countries. But again, this can cause migration to take place and we see that 
we are not we are not sure about the causes, but what we see is that there has been a very strong centralization in Norway, strong mig migration migration flows going from uh, from uh, particularly the northern part and towards the bigger cities in the in the in the southern part of the countries. And there are also some contract forces where which we see in Norway as we speak housing prices are uh, quite high in in urban areas they are increasing uh, but it's not only due to infrastructure investment programs but it has also a lot to do with uh, with uh, the taxation policy uh, that people or the citizens in this country has has incentives, perhaps too strong incentives to to invest in uh, in uh, in uh, real estate properties, flats and houses and things like that. But <coughs> the result is that when the costs are going up because of the migration flows, you get the spreading of activities to surrounding regions. It was a headline in, in one of the leading newspapers yesterday that prices in the areas that's, that surrounds Oslo, which is, uh, has benefited from rather low real estate prices, low housing prices, the prices are now starting, have started to increase quite sharply. And that is because the growth spreads out from the urban core and then uh, you, you can, uh, you can uh, experience that a number of surrounding areas will, will then get, uh, get this, uh, this increase in, in housing prices. So we are talking about <coughs> equilibria here. What type of equilibrium will we get if we invest in an urban transport package in a big city? What will happen in, uh, in other parts of the country? What will be the, the productivity effects of that when we talk about net effects? The net productivity effects. And I will come back to that next week, but you have to consider the benefits of an increasing size of an economic system in the, in the bigger cities. And, but you also have to take into account the loss of economic, uh, let's say, reduced size of the economic systems in peripheral areas, the areas that, uh, where people move from to get to the bigger cities. So that has also a cost to society when people are, are leaving. And they may then end, let's say, in a situation below a critical mass, where schools have to close down, shops have to close down, and so on, which reduces the other attractivity of, uh, of, uh, of moving there or even staying there. So this can take place, uh, according to his book, in periodic waves. Spreading activity can reduce capacity pressure in the centers. Then you can uh, have a regain of growth, causing a new wave of spreading of activities and so on. So this can be uh, an unstable equilibrium, so to speak. But he didn't say much about the critical mass problem. How big, how large should the concentration be to be self-sustainable in terms of having this self-perpetuating growth to take place. And that is something that has been focused in, in research uh, let's say, over a period of more than 50 years. So how large should the system be? And the answer is not, of course, not, not clear. 
here you can just see uh, what what I'm talking about when you talk about centralization. These are uh, the bigger cities, the bigger conurbations, concentrations of people. There has been a, 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 I mean this goes a bit up and down, but the trend from 1975 and up to uh, today is quite clear. And uh, these are the real periphery of, of Norway with a, with a clear decline in, uh, in, uh, in the population. And these are numbers of people moving per year. So the top was in 26, 2006, with around 9,000 people per year moving uh, that year. And uh, here also we see that uh, around 5,000 was moved from, from the most peripheral areas of Norway. I would like to see a graph <coughs> like this from China. Do you know how many people have moved from inland China and to the coast during, let's say, since the year 2000? Any guess? And then we talk about <coughs> the coastal line between Beijing up in the north and to Hong Kong down south. And you have a few bigger cities in between there. I think it's around 250 millions. And that is quite a lot. I mean, the whole population of China is 1.4 billion. So a little less than a a quarter of the population has, uh, has moved uh, during a rather short period of time. And that is, uh, I mean, so the numbers are, are even worse, relatively speaking, than, than this, these numbers for Norway. And the idea is to concentrate the activities, the urbanization, to get work, to get prosperity, uh, strong focus on the manufacturing industry, and then I'm talking about China. And uh, I would expect quite a lot of, of problems. I mean, to provide housing and infrastructure services for, uh, for a quarter of a billion people over a period of around 20 years or le even less is quite a, quite a task even for, uh, even for a, a big country. So, <coughs> so that was the outset here, cumulative causation. Self-reinforcing growth, self-reinforcing decline. Uh, a bit on how public policy, infrastructure policy, tax policy can affect uh, patterns and affect also the distribution of, uh, of uh, activities between central areas, peripheral areas. So now I'm going to start next, uh, the next session with this endogenous growth theory, where we take a closer look into what takes place here, here, and here. But we break before then, and hopefully they will, won't start working again next step with the drilling and things like that. <coughs>